Welcome to Bluegrass. We are so glad that you joined us today. We hope you find this time together to be uplifting and inspirational. Above all, we want you to feel welcome. So if you have any questions, prayer requests, or just want to know more about how to get connected to Bluegrass, visit bluegrassumc.org slash connect. Today we continue the series Out at Sea. Paul's long, difficult voyage at sea appeared to be out of control and out of hope, but he made it. Again, thanks for being with us today. Now, let's begin. As we gather this morning as a church to worship the one true God, the powerful God, the almighty God, let's read this call to worship together. Sing to the Lord a new song. Praise Him from the ends of the earth. Let the people sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give Him glory, glory to the Lord, and proclaim His praise. Church, let's sing. What are you turning to wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power, I got, I got. Let's continue our worship. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. No
Amen. continue singing praises, singing praises to Jesus our Savior. Let's worship His name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never. Join me in prayer. Oh, Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather and worship in your holy name. And your name is Holy, Holy, Holy. And so we have come to declare the greatness and the holiness and the love and the wonder of your name. And so we thank you for these moments of worship. 
these times set aside where we can focus on you, where we can claim you as our King and as our Lord, where we can reorient our lives and put you on the throne of our hearts. And so we ask that um, as you call us to worship, we invite you to come and do what you need to do in our lives during this time as well, that we might be in the right place with you and that we might humble ourselves before you and acknowledge your kingship, your lordship. Lord, as we do so, we are reminded that we have failed you, that we have sinned, that we have turned away from our trust in you and put our trust in ourselves and so many other things. And so we confess that, uh, we repent of that, and we would ask that you would cleanse us and that you would purify us and that you would make us whole and well throughout our whole being. We do lift up our congregation. We know that there are so many needs. There are folks who are struggling financially. There are folks who are struggling emotionally and, and relationally. They're struggling with their work. They're struggling with their health. They're struggling over a loss of a loved one. And Lord, you can come in the midst of all that and be the Lord God who provides, who brings comfort, who brings peace, who brings strength. And ultimately, you are the one who gives us our hope for a better day tomorrow. And I just pray that upon each and every person that finds at some point in their life a difficulty, a struggle. Lord, we pray for our world as well. We know that there is a great need for you in our nation and around the world. And may we humble ourselves before you and recognize that you are the one true God and that you are the one who will bring all things together again and make all things well again in the end. But between now and then, we want to make sure that we are humbly following you as your people. And so we ask and invite you to come into the mess of our world and, and bring order and bring peace and bring wholeness. Help us now as we pray that prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So it's been my experience that in every family there are two types of people. On the one hand, you have those who, when they hear storm sirens, they turn on the TV or open their weather app to see severe weather's coming. They, they listen to the advice of meteorologists and reporters who tell you to go someplace safe until it passes, and then they do exactly that. And on the other hand, there are those who, when the sirens sound and the experts give their advice, immediately run outside and stare at the sky for the next hour. So following that pattern, while I come from a long line of men who try to stare down or sleep through, depending on the time of day, every storm that comes their way, my wife is arguably far more responsible, making sure that she, the kids, and the dog are safely in the basement until Jeff Lyon says it's okay to come back out. And for me, that's just kind of always how storms have played out. When I was growing up, we didn't have a basement or anything, so when there were really bad storms with strong winds or tornado warnings, we, along with my aunts and uncles and cousins, would head to Grandma and Grandpa's house, where we were met with a finished basement, a, a TV where we could watch the weather and get updates, and a fridge full of mellow yellow. Because what better way to ride out a storm than with a bunch of overly caffeinated kids, right? And every time, without fail, my grandpa, my dad, and my uncles would stand on the back porch watching the storm roll in while grandma, mom, and my aunts kept telling them to come back in while giving regular weather updates and keeping an eye on us kids. Meanwhile, during all the excitement, the kids would have raided grandma's toy closet and board games and, and would spend the entire time playing without a care in the world. To us, it just seemed like an impromptu party with our cousins, which, which we were always up for. And this memory kept popping into my head as I was thinking about this week's message. This week, we're continuing our series, Out at Sea, as we look at Paul's journey to Rome to stand trial before Caesar and try to discern what lessons there are for us as we face our own times of trial. Last week, Doug told us about Paul trying to convince the centurion who was overseeing his journey not to sail on from the port in Fair Havens, where they had ended up after a change of course. Already sailing at a difficult time of year for travel on the Mediterranean, Paul was certain pressing on would lead to loss. Listening instead to the voices of the pilot and the owner of the ship, however, the centurion ordered the ship to sail on. And this week we see what happens next in Acts chapter 27, verses 13 through 20. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and couldn't head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and, and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So, Seeing what they believed to be their window, and in the face of the advice Paul has given, the ship sets sail. And sure enough, they're hit with a storm, just like Paul said, with violent winds and crashing waves, a storm that only gets worse as they press on and lasts for days into weeks. It gets so bad that they can't even steer the ship. Rather, the sailors just let the sea blow them where it will, doing their best to keep everything from coming apart. They secure the lifeboat, they tie ropes around the hull of the ship to keep it from breaking up, and in an attempt to just slow themselves down a little in case they hit something, they lower their sea anchor to create a bit of drag. And then as the violence of the storm gets worse, they start to throw stuff overboard to lighten the load, to stabilize the ship, and, and keep themselves from being broken to pieces if they run aground. And then we read, after many days where the storm raged so fiercely that they couldn't see the sun in the day or the stars at night, after they'd done everything they could, those on the ship come to the point of hopelessness, certain that this storm will be the end of them. And that's when Paul speaks, as we read in Acts chapter 27, verses 21 through 26. After they'd gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss, but now I urge you to keep up your courage. 
because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So after a long time of this, days and days of fighting the storm, struggling just to keep the ship afloat, being pelted by rain and wind and not eating to boot, Paul, who perhaps wasn't all that great at reading a room, stands up to say, I told you so. You should have listened. And if he had stopped there, there's little doubt that he would have been the next thing thrown overboard in the next verse. But fortunately for Paul and for the others of the ship, he had more to say. He says, you should have listened to me and we could have avoided all of this, but take courage. We're going to run aground. We're going to lose the ship, but not one life will be lost. God spoke this promise to me, so hold fast, stay strong, keep up your courage. I have faith that God will bring us through this just as he's promised. And it would be great if If just as Paul said those words, the skies cleared and birds started chirping, the sun was shining and and the boat came ashore on an island with everything the crew would need. But that's not how it happens. Paul speaks his words of encouragement and strength, claiming the promise of God, and the storm continues. Now, as we'll hear next week, the storm eventually ends, as all storms do. And God is faithful to his word, but what I want us to look at this week is Paul's confidence here in the face of the storm, even as it rages on. So back in April, or in COVID time, what feels like 10 years ago, I was leading an online study called Anxious for Nothing by Max Lucado that that deals with how we handle anxiety in life by looking at examples from scripture. You can find it in Study Gateway if you want to take a look at it. It's an online study resource we offer for free to the congregation at bluegrassumc.org slash study gateway. And this particular study was a great one in that it kind of met people where they were as everything with the pandemic was just ramping up. And we were all dealing with a lot of new uncertainties in the day-to-day of it all. So at some point in the study, we all kind of recognized together the seemingly calm manner with which folks in the Bible take on some pretty dramatic events. And interestingly enough, the conversation started with Paul. We had read this passage in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28, where Paul talks about some of the trials he's faced in his ministry. Doug referenced it a couple weeks ago. It goes like this. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. So it sounds like Paul's just having a great time, right? Living his best life now. And the response of several in the group to this passage was to wonder aloud, like, how does Paul even leave the house? With all that he's been through, how does he muster up the courage to to face another day, let alone another day of, of setting himself up for more of the same? But still, Paul presses on. Not only that, in the face of all these trials and tribulations, he says stuff like this in Philippians 1, 20 and 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by my life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And this is an echo of of the statement he makes earlier in Romans 14, 8, where he says this, If we live, we live for the Lord. 
And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And we as, as a group, we were kind of struck by this. Because here's Paul, this, this super apostle, telling us all about the crazy stuff he's experienced, wearing it as a badge of honor. And at the end of all of it, he still says, but you know what? Things are good. I, I'm good. If, if I live or die, whatever else comes down the line, I belong to God. So if it's all the same, if I'm still kicking around, I'm going to keep talking about Jesus. And when I die, I'm going to go be with Jesus. So don't you worry about me, Paul says. How are you doing? And that's just, just a great and a weird place to be, isn't it? And Paul's not alone in this kind of thought. This willingness to, to move forward into uncertainty and the unknown with a confidence that seems supernatural, certainly countercultural. Looking through scripture, we've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, who when told she's to give birth to the Son of God and raise him as her own, as she's instantly put into what could have been an impossible social situation. Opening her up to ridicule and potentially death replies, may your word to me be fulfilled. Inviting what was to come. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who when threatened with death reply, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Time and again in Scripture and in the history of the church in the world, we read of women and men of faith stepping forward in confidence, certainty even, regardless of the countless of unknowns, the threats, the challenges that may lie ahead of them. And the question that came up in that study group, and the question the sailors on Paul's boat were probably whispering among themselves at this point, was this, how do they do it? How do they step forward so boldly without knowing for sure where the next step is going to take them? What hardships or trials, what storms or tribulations may be just around the corner? And this is a powerful question. In no small part because of where we find ourselves right now. Many of us today, right here and in this moment, are in the midst of storms of our own. Both literal and metaphorical. Whether we turn on the news and see reports of the fires out west, hurricanes in the Gulf, or a global pandemic, or if our st storms are closer to home, job insecurity, financial struggles, health concerns, diagnoses and treatments, strained relationships, the loss of loved ones, or uncertainty and doubt about what things are going to look like on the other side of it all. Many of you, if I asked you what storm you're facing right now, would have an answer without hesitation. You wouldn't even have to think about it. So this question, how do Paul and others in Scripture speak so boldly of courage and pressing on in the face of such things is a powerful and pressing and pertinent one. And as we talked about it more in the group, the answer we ended up at together is this. The confidence we're reading in these stories, it it isn't a confidence in some specific short-term outcome. And by short-term, I mean anything less than eternity. But in the one in whom they believe, in the one who calls them forward to press on to weather the storm, theirs isn't a certainty in what will happen next. Paul, after all, he didn't have all the details about the timeline for the storm or, or some divinely inspired five-day forecast. No, theirs is a certainty in the God who has called them to what happens next and will carry them through it. It's this eternal perspective that sees the day-to-day -day of life in the context of a greater, timeless work of God, a work of restoration and redemption and victory. Sure, Paul wants the ship to get to shore safely as much as anyone he wants to continue the work to which he's been called and spend more time with his friends he's made along the way. He says as much in his letters. But he doesn't step out and, and speak up with his heart set on those hopes. 
but on the eternal hope of his Savior. And it's in that hope, that promise, that he finds the confidence to go into the world one more time. To speak courage and faith in the face of this storm and the storms yet to come. To proclaim the gospel with all he has in him. And to face the consequences of what may come as a result. It's in his confidence in the victory of Christ that Paul can declare with boldness to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because life and death have a different meaning for one who knows the gift of eternity given by the one who has defeated death. It's the same for Mary, who we mentioned earlier. One can only imagine what was going through her head as the angel was speaking. All the unknowns, all the fears, all the potential dangers she'd face as she walked this path. And yet, in her confidence in the faithfulness of the Lord, her response is that it would be so. That this message from God would come to pass, not because she knew every step that would follow, or because every fear had been addressed but because she knew the one in whom she was placing her trust. She knew the one who sees past the current trial, through the present hardship, and whose voice can still the storms. And you know, I, I realize as I say all this that, that it isn't any great new insight. It's nothing you haven't heard before. Back in the day when I was the director of student ministries here at Bluegrass, the kids and I always used to joke that if I ever called on you and your mind wandered or, or you were just distracted and completely caught off guard, you could usually get close to the right answer by turning to the standby responses, the classic Sunday school answers, right? God, Jesus, Bible, prayer. And it's one of those things that's funny because it's kind of true. But sometimes the reason the old standbys become the old standbys is precisely because they're true. Look at Paul's response to everything he's faced in his ministry, the present storm included. His answer to every situation is always rooted in a trust in the God to whom all creation belongs, a faith in the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, a reliance upon God's revelation of himself in Scripture, and attentiveness and listening to the heart and mind of God in a conversational relationship in the present moment. God, Jesus, Bible, prayer. So no, this may not be some new insight, some brilliant theological breakthrough. It may even verge on the point of cliche. But I think it's an important reminder for all of us in the season in which we find ourselves. As individuals and a community, as people together, as we move forward in this ever-changing landscape. Into times of calm or whatever storm comes next. As with so many things in life, there was no class in school. There was likely no job experience to prepare us for how to take on many of the challenges we'll face in this life. A lot of the time we're figuring it out as we go, steering as best as we can while the wind and the waves push us along. But in all of it, we find encouragement, hope, excitement even, in the knowledge that no matter how shaky things may seem at times, how unsteady we may feel on our feet, or how the waves may knock us around, our God remains constant. Our God is faithful, and that hasn't changed, nor will it ever. As we weather the storm, as we face the trial, as we endure the tribulation, what we learn is that when God calls us to follow, it may mean we discover new ways to move and work and speak. It may mean that we're called out of comfort and to follow where we can't see, holding the hand of the one who would lead us. Confident that the hand that holds ours is the Almighty God who is worthy of our trust and our affection. It was because I knew my dad had his eye on the storm and my mom had her eye on me that I was able to rest, trust, and even play in my grandparents' basement all those years ago as the winds blew, as the lightning crashed and the rain came down. In the same way, as together we face whatever storms may come down the line, ours is not to worry about tomorrow or the next day or the day after that, to be consumed by anxiety and fear, but to follow in the steps of the one who is leading us. To listen to the voice of the one who speaks of the kingdom of God and sings songs of salvation. 
to hold the hand of the one in whose hands we are held, and as we do so, to move forward in the confidence that God has called us, and God will carry us, and God is using us to shine the light of the gospel in a world looking for a firm place to stand. Now hear me, friends. Let me make this clear. Because we don't want to get confused. Just because God's got you, it doesn't mean you have a license to behave foolishly. Paul wasn't looking for opportunities to get beaten up. He didn't tell the pilot of the ship to steer toward larger waves, sharper rocks, or stronger winds. The call, after all, isn't to reckless abandon, but to relentless faith and trust in the Lord of all creation, in whom we find comfort and courage strength and sustaining, and the capacity to go out into the world proclaiming the gospel in whatever ways are available to us, in whatever circumstances we may find ourselves. The call of the church in every season has been to live in the light of eternity in the here and now, proclaiming the gospel in word and deed by any means available, and the pursuit of that call will sometimes find us in the middle of a storm, facing the unknown and unplanned in the best way we can. And when those times come, take courage, find strength, listen for the voice of the one who calls us his, who calls us daughters and sons, the voice that calls out above the wind and the rain saying, follow me, know me, be loved by me, be held in my arms and trust me to lead you where you need to go, to empower you to do what you need to do and to carry you home at the end. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much that in all seasons and all circumstances, you are with us. You remain constant. You remain God. And there is nothing that will shake you from that place. There is no storm strong enough to remove you from that place. And so, Lord, as we go into the world, as we confront various storms of various kinds, Whatever we may come up against in this life, help us to look to you, to remember you, to trust you and your leadership, to hope in you, Lord God, and your salvation. Help us not to get so focused on the storm that we lose hope. But Lord, give us courage, strength, vision to see past the clouds, to see the great work you're doing in the world and in us, a work that continues even now. Lord, we thank you that you are God, that we are yours, and in the confidence of that knowledge, in the confidence of that hope, we can endure anything that may come, in the knowledge that at the end of it all, there is victory. There is rest, there is hope, there is joy, there is life with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, church, let's continue singing, praising God for his amazing grace through the blood of Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now was blind but now I see t'was grace that taught my heart
has promised good to me is worth my hope secures he will my shield and portion as long as I As always, we want to thank you so much for worshiping with us. It is, it is a great pleasure to gather with you each week, even as we do so virtually. Um, and to those who have continued to support the ministry and work of the church through the worship of giving, we thank you. If you'd like to do so, you can find out ways to do that at bluegrassumc.org slash give. Whatever you do, however you are serving the kingdom of God in this time, we thank you for being the church in the world. And we look forward to seeing you next week.